Uh, my name is Jim G. I work here. And uh, you guys asked me to talk, so you have to suffer through this. Um, I'm going to talk to you today as a linguist um, and a relatively disgruntled linguist for the last 40 years. Uh, so let's start with an interesting question. I mean, I do discourse analysis now as one enterprise. And, uh, you know, ling linguists like grammar. I started my career as a syntactician. And there's a, you know, kind of, we don't have really good ways of talking about grammar. And we have sort of the problem that if you do discourse analysis or in linguistics, you, you, you use a lot of grammar as a foundation, but you don't stray too far into the social. You, you get up to maybe social interaction conversation, but you certainly don't get all the way up to institutions, usually. On the other hand, many people do kind of thematic discourse analysis and have a lot to say about politics, society, and institutions, but you never hear anything about grammar. So the two don't meet very well. And so even though I know we all take grammar for granted, uh, let's ask why we have it, what it's for. And I don't mean grammar and grammar books. I mean the one in your head. So we are pretty sure that you have a grammar in your head in some fashion. And we're pretty sure I have a farm and a lot of animals. And I'm pretty sure my donkeys don't. Right? That was one of uh, Chomsky's key points, is that donkeys don't have it, and we do. Uh, but I want to ask, what's it doing in there? Now, um, probably, I mean, even though it's controversial, it seems to me, shouldn't be, uh, there has to be some sort of biological instinct for grammar in human beings because they can learn any human language, right? It is a baby, you can steal them and put them anywhere. Um, uh, we're pretty good at it. And all human languages have some similarities that probably if Martians have language, we wouldn't have. For example, they all have predication and they're based around propositions in philosophical sense, clauses in a linguistic sense. So um, I, let's just marvel at that fact. Now, of course, grammar is also something that isn't just situated in your head. You learn a specific language and that gives you a set of social conventions that take your grammar in a certain direction. But what's it doing sitting up there? Why do we have it? What do we get for it? Uh, why don't donkeys have it? And uh, does it do us any good? And then what should be its role in analyzing the social? Now, um, people like Chomsky have argued, this is not a point he cares a lot about, but he's argued that you know, lots of people who are in applied linguistics think language is there. It evolved for us to be social or for us to engage in communication or for us to engage in social collaborative endeavors, right? That is kind of an argument that a lot of people make. Chomsky said, no, I mean, it's probably there for us to think with. It's probably how, so if you think about it, I mean, we can certainly think without language, but if you're thinking in terms of language, that is the grammar of a language, you're thinking propositionally. And there are lots of things you can do in thinking propositionally that the donkey can't do. For example, you can say, boy, I wished I had done that much sooner than, I, than yesterday because now I really regret having done it. Right? The donkey can't say that, can't think that. That's involved. That, yeah. What? Uh, I've asked, Art. <laughs> I've asked. I've, I know donkey ease too. I'm multilingual. Um, Let's just assume they can't. Maybe they can. <laughs> uh, actually, I consider animals quite superior to human beings, so that was not a, not a criticism. <laughs> now, um, so, and, and it probably is true, I mean, that humans think in certain ways that are certainly facilitated in some part by the fact that our languages have certain structures. Uh, I want to take, though, and start with another uh, idea. It doesn't exclude any of the other ones. You know, lots of things can be true. Um, and that is that grammar is a system of choices, right? It gives you choices. And that humans, unlike probably donkeys, are built to communicate with each other by making and signaling choices, right? Think about this. I mean, if, all, if they only made ties in one color, you could wear a tie or not wear a tie. And then that choice would make people say, well, why did you do that? Why did you wear a tie that, rather than not or not? And then figuring out why you made that choice will become part of the public meaning of wearing a tie. 
right? It's very simple. If there's only one color, though, making the choice to wear that color won't buy you anything. If there's lots of colors, like very bright colors and very dark colors, then I can say, well, why do you, you know, the there may be no answer to the question, but I mean, what we humans do is we raise the question. We think you don't show off choices for no consequential reason. Now, grammar is replete with the ability to make choices. I mean, it is the resources by which you can say not the same thing, but similar things in a great many ways. Now, I'll give you an example. This is a real example. It comes from an, uh, a, an article that was on CNN back right after Trump got elected. And uh, uh, there was a conference uh, that white nationalists were at. I mean, it wasn't a conference just for white nationalists, really, but it was. And um, this guy got himself in trouble. So this is the beginning of their article. A member of a white nationalist group was bloodied Saturday while confronting a large group of protesters, right? That's how the person wrote the thing. Now, if you are a speaker of English, you know there are 4,000 other ways to say that, right? Uh, none of them can mean exactly the same thing because there is kind of a principle in linguistics, there's no true synonymy, right? But they're in the same ballpark. So we could have said, a large group of protesters bloodied a member of a white nationalist group Saturday, or a white nationalist was injured Saturday when he provoked a large group of protesters, or a, a shoving match ensued when a white nationalist confronted a group of protesters Saturday. And we could go on forever. I could make different word choices, phrase choices, clause choices, active versus passive, modal, not modal. I mean, you know, we could go on literally for almost forever. Now, the capacity uh, that we have, that be, as native speakers of a language, the capacity we have to be aware of all those choices, at least uh, subconsciously, is quite incredible. So there are studies in psycholinguistics that show and, uh, and, uh, that when you hear a sentence, that sentence might have dozens of ambiguities, the, the possible meanings by its structure if you take the structure in one way or the other. And uh, the one theory is we quickly, as a, our syntactic processor, runs through all of them and then uses context and semantics to exclude all but one, right? That we actually process the entire thing. It's not consequential whether you believe that or not, but all I'm saying to you is as an English speaker, you could readily make up more choices. So the theory that I'm pushing, which is just a theory, by the way, I'm trying to get a theory so I can make a model and make some predictions and explanations of things, which I'll end by giving an example of. Uh, the, the theory here is that these four things have meaning for two reasons. One is they have meaning because you know the meaning of the words and the phrases and sentences. And two, because you know that having said it one way excluded all the others. By the way, this is the oldest, you've read Saussure, this is the oldest principle in linguistics. That, um, so one of the ways you do it, I'm going to argue that you interpret that, especially if you care about it, is you ask yourself, well, why did she use bloodied? Or why did she use the white member as uh, the subject and not the protesters? Why confronted rather than provoked, right? You, because if you care about figuring out what she means, you are trying to set uh, why this was chosen. Now, you know, this is, this is the whole thing. I mean, the first part of the real article, a member of a white nationalist group was bloodied Saturday while confronting a large group of protesters outside the site of a Washington conference celebrating Donald Trump's presidential victory. Now, I, here's my rewrite of it. And I'm using information that I know the reporter knew, right? So I'm going to put more in this than she did. That's another choice, how much information to put in and, and how to package that information as a choice. And here's what, how I would have put it. That's why I'm not a journalist. A large group of protesters bloodied a man attending the annual Washington National Policy Institute conference which this year was celebrating the election of Donald Trump when he approached them with a video camera and a microphone in what appeared to be an attempt to film an interview with one of the protesters. Now, notice I put in information that would really kind of change your attitude a bit. You certainly will want to wonder what a conference about policy is doing celebrating the election of Donald Trump, right? 
Um, and it also tells you that this scuffle was over him trying to interview somebody by putting a microphone in their face. Now, my point just is that's the little mini theory that choices matter. And that, uh, and I first want to argue we do this in lots of things that aren't language. Still in ways the donkeys don't. And let me give you an example. Um, because what I'm arguing here is that grammar is a system of choices that are particularly built to give certain sorts of meanings by us thinking about the other choices that were available. And I'm going to show you later, literally, what those types of meanings are. Um, but we do it in other semiotic systems. You don't have to use language to do this. Uh, do you hear, so I, and, and the other semiotic systems, because they're nowhere near as complex as language, the, the thing gets much simpler, but still very complex. So here is the picture. Uh, don't stare at the fact that one of the people in this picture is in the audience. Um, this is a picture of three people. Uh, now, obviously, I chose those three people. So you are probably saying, why did he choose those three people? And you're probably saying he chose that guy in the middle because he's so good looking, right? <laughs> um, what, uh, what does this picture tell you? Why do you think I chose it? It's three people. They're of different ages. You surely see that. You don't think I'm as old as Dave Berliner, I hope. <laughs> the man's, you know. I worked for him in 1974. He was, I was a mere child. So these are three professors from three different generations. Uh, all of them went, got their PhD at Stanford. All of them are Californians by uh, birth, as far as I know. Berliner certainly was there when he was young. Um, and uh, he's the generation of academics before me, and it was not the least bit uncommon uh, for those academics to wear a suit when they were being a professor. In fact, most of my professors wore suits. Uh, by the time the baby boom became academics, they dressed like this, right? Notice no suit. And in fact, they wouldn't. I've never worn a suit to class, and I would bet you there is just a boatload of people my age who haven't done it. Um, and then the third one is a very young man from the current generation of academics uh, who is dressed even more casually than I am in the picture. Now, this, you know that for post-Berliner, for me and Brian, we had a choice. He owned suits, actually. He could have worn a suit. He could have worn anything. I don't own one, but I could buy one. I could afford one now in my old age. Um, <laughs> So you know we made a choice, and you, 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 but what I want you to look at this is this is, a, this is like a grammatical system, right? Because you know the choice, so you know when you wear uh, a shirt like this, it isn't the shirt you would have worn with a cert, suit. You know that if you've been in our society. These are not biological, they're just social conventions, but if you don't know them, you don't know what any of this means. Now, let's say we wanted to explain. So the normal explanation for why people are dressed this way is they just wanted to. But see, that would leave out the fact that most people, not all, in Berliner's time dressed that way. Most people in my time, except for psychometricians, uh, dressed the way I did, at least in the fields I was familiar with. And a lot of people, certainly all the young people I have taught with, dressed like Brian. So it can't be just individual choice. Now, there are actually theories about this. It's been written about, and I'm not going to bore you with them. But if you wanted to explain how these choices arose and what they mean and what they function in society, it's actually very complicated. So there are people who have written about this as formed by status, that in the age before me, professors were paid similarly to business people, saw themselves at the same status level of business people, had a secretary, um, and, uh, and dressed like them. By the time the baby boom comes along, the status of professors has fallen below the status of business people. And so there, there is a theory. I'm not pushing these theories. I'm telling you they've been written. There is a theory then that you know, my generation is dressing down in order to thumb their nose at the status people who have higher status like the business people to show it doesn't matter to us that we're our own people. And I don't know. People haven't written about Brian's generation. Uh, but he is in the age where tenure is about to go or is deteriorating further. That's one theory. Another theory, that, the, by the way, that could both be true, is people have written a lot about how over the last several hundred years, 
in Western society, there has been uh, a trend to mask the, uh, the, sh the display of status and power, that is to hide it. So you could see each of these as part of this masking, that Berliner is displaying status more overtly than me, and I'm displaying it more overtly than Brian, and the next generation who will be nude will be displaying <laughs> it less. So the point, my point, I don't care what you believe. I just care that, that you see that if you see this as a designed set of choices available conventionally in society to explain that will involve, you will first have to show the grammar of clothes. And it won't be the same for different societies. Then you will have to show how do people meet, what are the ways socially, institutionally, culturally that people make meaning of that. And then of course you could say what are the effects. It's complicated, right? There's a the real theory, but you are going from a grammar, this one a very simple one, sort of. All right, that's the point, that's the theory. If you don't like it, you can leave. <laughs> now, because you're not gonna like any of this. So now I wanna ask, um, okay, I, why are human beings built to be this way? And why did we build the ultimate system of choice, grammar, that gives us nearly infinite choices? Why, 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 why did we, how did it make us a certain sort of creature and what sort of creature did we have to be in order to evolve this system? And here I'm going to go back to a very old theory that I played with when I was a child and I still think is important, but it is absolutely a theory that comes out of an earlier form of uh, Marxism that people would consider quite irrelevant to linguistics. And then one of the themes of this talk is if we're going to build bigger theories that get across academic silos and deal with issues that are complex and whole, uh, we are going to have to begin to ask, are there theories out there that at first seem irrelevant, uh, but they actually might be quite relevant? And maybe when we understand them, pretty identical to the ones we developed in other words, right? That's part of the thing. Now, um, so here's, imagine I'm standing on a curb with my arm up. And you have to say, that's an interesting choice. Why is he standing there? Well, pretty much, but not exactly the same gesture could be hailing a cab or a hitching a ride. And you're going to look in the context and say, one or the other might be true. But let's say I'm doing this and a cab drives by because he has, he has taken that signal to mean hailing a cab, he gets, and I get into the cab. At that point, irregardless of my intentions, irregardless of what I meant, I have hailed a cab. <laughs> right? That's public meaning. I can't say, oh no. See, if I say, no, I don't want a cab, I have no intention of paying you. Well, now you just made it a different action, a trip to jail. So um, <laughs> on the other hand, if somebody comes by in a regular car and picks me up and I get in, uh, then I have hitched a ride. I've uh, hitched a ride, and again, if I say, "Well, you know, I, I demand to pay you," I'll just be an eccentric hitchhiker. I will not <laughs> be a cab passenger. Now, this little type of example was used by this really at one time, still, but at one time, quite well-known Marxist theorist. After writing in the uh, after the 58 Hungarian Revolution, where people were trying to g get formulations of Marxism that were more humane. Um, and uh, it, what he would say is going on in this little scenario of cabs versus, by the way, think of Uber as yet a different, is he would talk about people co together constituting mutual subjects, or what we could call identities, right? What he called them subjects. And, and he had a very interesting point to make about subjects. For you to be a subject, for example, to be a cab driver, that is, a subject means a type of person doing something that is identifiable as an identity, right? Or, or a role, if you like that. And so for you to be a cab driver or a cab passenger requires some social force. He talked about institutions that allows that to happen, sets up the conventions by which that can happen. And uh, the interesting thing, when, so it allows you to be an agent, subject in the agent sense. Notice this word comes from grammar. It allows you to be a subject in the agent sense. I can be uh, a cab driver or I can hail and get a, pass, a, a cab. 
But on the other hand, he pointed out that this social force that allows you to be an agent, to be an actor, is always also making you subject to it. You're subjected to it because you have to, I can't ride the cab without being subjected to the conventions and laws and rules and regulations of the cab driving companies. And the same with hitchhiking, I have to be. So he's pointing out that the cost, see, I, by the way, I'm taking all the Marxism out of this, not because I don't like it, but because that's something we'd have to add back in with, with a different political theory, in my view. Um, it, so the cost of being an actor socially, an agent, a subject of a sentence, a transitive sentence, is also to be subjected by some force to which you, in, in the process of subjecting you, yourself to the values, the norms, the conventions of that force, then you become an actor, right? You're both subjected, you're both a patient, as linguists say, in a case or object of a transitive sentence, and you are a subject. They go together. Now, uh, in a typical terms of those days, he call, he's talking about institutions as the social force, but he says that subjects, that is people like cab drivers, or by the way, a perfect example, professors and students. I can be, I'm a professor right now and therefore I look like I have a lot of aging and action, but I can only be this actor if I subject myself to the roles of the university. If I branch into a lot of sexual innuendo, my role will change quickly, right? So he calls the actors, the subjects that are produced by this force that he calls institutional apparatuses, the ide an ideological effect, which he means by this is that that social force institutions has norms and values about how the world is or should be ordered. What is, what is the proper way to do things or what is the proper hierarchy of people? What are the proper ordering of things, and he calls, and he, he really can't act out something meaningful unless you have some theory of what's the proper ordering of things here. And he calls that ideology and says that in the act of us joining those values, conventions, and constraints, we act on that order of things, produce ourselves as an actor, but are subjected to that order, which could be in some cases a dominant order that is screwing us. That's the Marxist bit. All right, now the other thing just to point out, to add to that, it, that he doesn't do as much, but we certainly can know is not only does the, whatever this social force is produce actors, that is, you know, professors or cab drivers or uh, politicians or anybody else, uh, it also constrains the topics, that is the talk, the content of what you can do. See, so right now, in order for me to be a professor, I have to subject myself to the ideology of the institution. Ideology is not here being used as a dirty word. That is the values and norms about how things are ordered. Um, and I also have to uh, follow their uh, values and norms about the, what I can talk about. Right? It's pretty wide, but it's not infinite by any means. I, I could show you that, but I'm too old. All right, now I myself, so what is this force? Now for him, that force was institutions because he was interested in how ca institutions and capitalist society both create actors and then in the process constrain them in certain ways that create forms of domination. But today, you don't have to have an institution to see this work of a social force constituting subjects of a certain type. So for example, we have a lot of things, let's say you went on to uh, the many internet sites uh, that are fan fiction. They uh, will constitute you as an agent that is a fan fiction writer, only if you subject yourself to the values and norms of how readers are ordered, how reading is done, how it's responded to. That however is an emergent property of the people over time, not an institution, right? This is not, an, it's not a brand new thing in the world, but with the internet, it is a very much, it's gotten much bigger. That is, we don't need institutions anymore to um, co constitute a value system in terms of which you become an actor who is constrained, right? This can happen in these emergent ways. And, and in addition, of course, if we could ever agree on what the word culture means, cultures are clearly such a force. Uh, but we really do need to be more careful what that word means. 
So I have used in my past work, and it does not matter, the word discourse is with a big D. That just means to me any set of things and forces and, uh, and ways in the world that creates identities like professor by setting up a set of normative order and backing that up often with some constraints that can be enforced in some ways. But you can call it anything you want. One of my themes here is the reason we make so little progress in going across silos, we can never agree what the word means. And furthermore, you can never agree that two words we've used mean something similar or not, right? So I don't want to get fussy about the words. Now, this is just a small point before I go on to the examples. So it's back to grammar. I, I was using uh, that uh, neo-Marxist theory of subjectivity, if you want to use term that nobody knows what it means. Um, <laughs> then, uh, but it, you know, if you think about it, that thing of a force that sets up norms in terms of which you can have a subject and, and an object and a topic is the trans, the, is tran, what Halliday calls transitivity, right? It's the heart of language that is an agent that puts a force on an object and that, uh, he not only argues that's the center of grammar, but transitivity, that is this system of subjects as agents and objects as patients, which we can reverse, right, because of the choices. We can make one the other and the other one. That, um, that really is the structural foundation of humans' theories of causation and acting, which is central to a human being, right? So what you can say is that this, if, the theory that I laid out of the mutual construction of actors is a social theory and, and a political theory. It's really the acting out in the world of human views of causation and actors and respond. Notice, I mean, humans, causation is not like in physics. Our theories of ca uh, causation are always interlaced with theories of responsibility. Who's responsible for something, right? Um, I don't know how far we want to push that, but it's cute. All right, let me stop there if there's any questions about that, because I'm going to give an example and then quit. But if I've been totally unclear, or if you thought I was nasty to my sources, speak up. Or forever hold your peace. Art's already accused me of insulting donkeys, so. Yes? So shall we uh, put today's, in today's discussion, shall we, put the, shall we make that grammar the capital G grammar? We could. I'm, I'm all for anything with a capital G. Um, you know, there, it would be an interesting concept to, uh, it, you know, I don't want to go into this, but you know, we have very, very poor views of formal semantics because linguists have theories of formal semantics that they never spell out of how it gets to situational meanings. And people who believe in situational meanings don't believe in formal semantics. But um, the way I would formulate formal semantics would be in a type of thing that analogous to a big D discourse, but that is a, you know, a system of core concepts that then are instantiated, much like the what I just gave, there. Um, okay, so now let me. So my argument is this: that grammar is our best system for making choices, but we have a billion of them. That we are built to communicate with each other in part by a system that says, I make a choice, you know the possibilities. By your asking, why did, why did I make that choice? You're asking, what does it mean that I did it? But also, what does it mean that I excluded the other stuff? And then to make that meaning, you have to consider all the social and cultural knowledge, institutional knowledge we have in common, right? You have to know a lot. You have to be a social theoretician right on the ground. So, but on the other hand, if this is how the human mind is partly built, and it's partly what we marry to grammar, then it's also how we represent stuff in texts and in talk. That is, we, we don't use language just to construct, along with other stuff, subjects. We also often use language to construct subjects uh, in a certain way, right? And, and we can't understand that language and that practice unless we have this lens, I argue. And, it's consequential, right? I want to argue, I'm going to give you an example. It's consequential how people 
do this, and grammar plays a role in this, and it must, because if the thing that's giving the foundation of the choices plays a role, it's got to be consequential in what happens. So here is, I'm going to look at, so you, you know that even though this is not how uh, Halliday or Chomsky do the grammar, that there is a type of grammar that's usually called pattern grammars, that grammar has a lot of patterns that already have a meaning, not just, so it's not just words. Uh, the patterns have meanings. There's lots of them. And um, here is, so here's a pattern that I will call the locator pattern. This is a little bit of grammar. There are people who hate this stuff, but um, the, here is the locator pattern. The, the locator pattern is a way to locate one thing in reference to another. And there's two ways to do it, right? So you can say John is standing next to the fountain or John is next to the fountain. And basically, the two, they're both in the, lo you're locating somebody to a reference point. Uh, in the first one, you are relating John and the fountain by the process standing by which they got that way, right? And then the second one, you just leave the process out. You're locating him to the fountain, but you're not saying how he got there. But in both cases, this is a pattern of locating one thing in relationship to another. Uh, notice that uh, w when I say John is next to the fountain, that isn't a personal property of John. You, you can't, it's not like, uh, you know, John has black hair or John is a, a courageous person. It, it isn't a property of John per se internally. It's just a property of space. You can't, can, you can't compliment John on what a great stander next to fountains he is. <laughs> All right. So in this pattern, John is sitting in the armchair. John's in there. John finished fourth in the race. John was fourth. John placed 90. John. It, I mean, it's you can do it in, all day long, right? See, I, I'm I'm trying to belabor this because it seems trivial. I'm going to show you it's not trivial. I'm going to show you the grammar, if seen as a set of choices, is not trivial. All right. There, now there is another pattern that is different from the locator pattern, the personal property pattern, which. Um, says you have a property that's part of you. And one way, there's two ways to do this too. John is a tall person. It gives you a property by saying what group you're in, right? He's in the group of tall people. What set are you in? You're in the group of tall people or you're in the group of cautious. John is a cautious person. John's an African American. John is an honorable person. But we can also, instead of naming the group you are in, we can name the property the group has and say John is tall, John is cautious, John is African American, John is honorable, right? It's pretty clear, right? So we have one way to locate things and two ways to say it. We have uh, a, w a way to give personal properties to people and two ways to say it. By the way, are any of you old enough to remember Gilbert Ryle? Any Gilbert Ryle fans? God, I gotta be the oldest person in the room. Well, well, he talked about category errors, and so since you don't know him, I'm not going to attribute this to him, so it'll look original. He, he didn't use this example. This comes from Arizona. He's been dead a long time. All right, so, um, so category errors. Here is a sentence. John scored three on the English as a second language test. John is a three on the English. What pattern is that in? Is this locating John with something, or is it giving him a personal property? It, it, by the pattern, John scored three, he, is the process which relates John and three on a list was scoring. And then so John is three just leaves out the process. This is clearly grammatically in the locator pattern. The reason you are uh, having a hard time thinking about this is exactly going to be my argument. Some people have tricked you to put that in the personal property. Thing. And you've all been part of the process. But that is clearly just locating John on a list. It's a locator pattern. Now here is some talk. You know in this state, uh, a very benighted state, we have done many stupid things educationally. And one of the stupidest was the current block program that we said that if you need to learn English as a second language, you should be taken out of your content courses and put in a literacy block to do, you know, literacy for hours 
outside of content and determining your level. There's a test, and you, if you're a one, two, or three on the test, you have to take this course. And if you're four, you can be exempted. I think that's how it works. And um, the interesting thing uh, about it is it violates everything we know about research. Uh, you, the people are losing content while they're learning English. Learning to read it from one language to another is transferable. So if you learn content in Spanish, you'll probably learn to read English as transfer, and you won't have lost the content. You know, we could go on and on and on. But they did it. And, and of course, teachers, it, it, this, by the way, is a perfect example of an institutional apparatus with an ideology. You have a set of social for, forces, namely sort of institutions and policymakers in Arizona, that create a, a value system about how things should be ordered, in this case, who's one, two, three, and four in learning English. And then you can only be in the, a, an agent in that unless you're, in, in, unless you're subjected to the system, right? If you, if you don't get the score, you can't be an actor. But if you get the score, you're screwed, right? That was kind of the. So here, so teachers, this is a thesis that was written here a few years ago um, with, by a woman named Amy who's in here. And these are teachers talking about their experience. They've been assigned to these classes. So, Erica says, but I think I've probably, probably seen this difference because uh, I'm, I'm, my classroom is the mix. I have threes and fours. So I can see like those students who, I have some threes that I swear could be fours. I don't think they're three. And uh, Amy, the, t the graduate student says, what do you see as the distinction between a three and a four? And they say, like, they learn well. I don't say they learn things faster, but they seem to pick up a little faster. And then their output, spoken English, is so different. And Joni, another teacher, says, between a four and a three, yeah. And Erica says, oh, yes, like, the output is different. Like, they're kind of the kids that will take the language objectives and remember to use it. They're the ones that are a little bit more self-initiated. They, you know, a three rather than two. They will try to read if you point to the words and follow me. They will. These are seen as differences between a three and a four. And then Joni says, my home base is fours. I mean, they rock. Most of my kids rock. What's happening here? A, 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 an attribute that makes, merely locates you on a list is being put inside the person as a personal property. Now, since we, we certainly know there's no research that shows She's, she's saying threes are more proactive, they behave better, they uh, do what you tell them. There, there's no research showing that the quality of your English language learning correlates with your um, conscientiousness, right? But she's assuming it does. Because look what's happening. The state legislated this location, a label. And then it, they have to act on it and they need to think it's fair and real. And so they're attributing the property to the kid. That is not, it's not like he's wearing the jersey three. He's got it in his soul. But now we have to find internal definitional properties of it. Proactivity, follow directions better, you know, whatever. We've got it. We've got to. So what they are doing is they are taking a category error. They're treating a statement, by the way, a placing on a test is putting you on a list it has not said anything yet about your soul. It takes work to change something from the locator pattern to the personal pattern. So, the, uh, so they're creating a new type of subject that has never existed before on Earth, a three. There are, you can go around and say, John, you are one of the best threes I know. Or, God, John, you wear your three as a badge of pride. Or, John, you are really a two. I saw into your soul and you, were, you was a three on the test, but you're a two. And don't think you can get away with it, right? <laughs> so this takes social works. They are constituting from a list, a location, a set of new subjects that allows the child to be an actor. Oh, you were a good three. You did your three thing. Only if the child is subjected to the system when the system is the result both of a category error, that I would argue a mis deep misunderstanding of tests, um, as would I think people like Bob Mislevy. Uh, who knows a lot more about tests than I do. Uh, and, but in the act, and this constitution, of course, there's a social force. That social force was institutions that through their ideology, that are, their ideas about how to order things, 
have created systems of domination and control and therefore really encouraged the teachers to do the work necessary to change, in this instance, the locator pattern into the personal pattern, with deep consequences that a kid has gotten a, 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 attributes, the teacher is assuming correlations between attributes that have no evidence, but we know after she assumes them and acts on them, there will be evidence for it. So that's grammar to society. And uh, I think we can do a lot better if we keep both in the picture, but we have to, we ha I'm trying to give you a model that makes some connection between them. And I have done so by appealing to an old Marxist theory that is, by the way, what you English people call, if you really built theory, recipient design. It's the same thing. It's the same thing with Bakhtin meant by ventriloquism. We could go on. We have these theories. The theory of apparatuses or social forces of discourse is the same theory that people deal with community of practice or activity theory. You see my point? Is it looks like old style Marxism, but in fact, we've formulated these theories over and over again and then bickered over the words uh, and not related them back to the very system there, therefore. So I'll make the bold claim with no evidence that uh, grammar exists in your head and not in the donkeys because we are part of a system of control and domination by our very standing as a type of creature. Thank you.